think 23% of those are in private practice. I have a holistic nursing practice about an hour north of here where I work for four months with my clients. Uh, they pay me directly. Insurance doesn't cover it, but that is my nursing practice. And I use uh, alternative and complementary modalities of a wide variety of kinds, and I miss those with 40 years of practice as a nurse. So it is a nursing practice. Now, what are the most commonly used complementary modalities? If you look at the literature, prayer is free, and nutrition, exercise, group support, imagery, relaxation, those are simple. Mm -hmm. And they make a huge, huge difference. If you can just teach somebody to breathe deeply, to open up the soles of their feet as if they were growing roots, you go ahead and do that. Uncross your legs. Imagine yourself growing roots into the soles of the, uh, so out of the soles of your feet into the earth, way below, where several floors up. So these are deep roots. Now take a deep breath. And allow yourself, your body, your tissues to relax. You've been in meetings, you've been with friends, been a busy few days. So imagine the breath you're taking in, breathing out, going down your body, out the soles of your feet, into the roof, uh, the floor below, into the ground below. So because of your breathing and your breathing alone, you're going to make this hotel float on air because you're breathing. Now notice as you breathe, notice as your body relaxes, what happens to the muscles in your back? What happens to the muscles around your kidneys? Take a deep breath, exhale through your mouth, take another one. You'll notice if you exhale through your mouth, your next inhale will be deeper. A trick to help your patients breathe deeply, and an exhale through their mouth. Very simple. And the last thing, if you will bring your, your uh, attention back to the moment, The last, uh, the, one of the other things is to involve your own healing per, uh, progress and to integrate self-care and spirituality. I know that there's an organization of spiritual nursing, and um, I don't know what their focus is. Ours is you. Know, ours is me. That I grow as a human being and I deepen my spirituality, my relationship with the divine, as I care to know that and my self-care. So in my life, I've added all of those and a whole lot more. One of the things that you may want to think about putting into your life this summer is the American Holistic Nurses Association is meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. Anybody here from Wisconsin? Okay. Um, when you get yourself around a number of holistic nurses who do their self-care and are growing themselves spiritually, you're in a different environment than you will ever be in any other situation. You're surrounded by these people, and you're going to have one of the most delightful experiences of your life. Our focus this year is creating sacred space. That doesn't sound like a nursing thing, does it? But you can learn to create sacred space in a hospital room and make that room sacred for that client, that patient, so that that person can grow to do the healing they want to do. It's not in your hands or in the home of an unheard mother or somebody uh, down on their luck, you can create sacred space wherever you are. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in the convention this year. So what is a holistic nurse? First of all, we're instruments of healing. And we mean that quite literally. You're all the clients the patients have got. You're there. Yeah, you bring everything you've learned in class. That you've learned your physics, already your physiology, you've learned your biology, you've learned uh, how to catheterize a person, how to put in an IV, how to do all the things with all the machines. You've even learned how to sit and talk with a person, but you are the ultimate instrument for that person. So how do you become an instrument? And that's what we'll be doing with the, uh, with the exercise. You're also a facilitator in the healing process, keeping in mind that Florence Nightingale really did say it, and I've come to believe she's absolutely right is that all our job is to do is to put the person in the state uh, so that nature can do its job. That's it. That's all we can do. And if you are the instrument, how do you do that? Do you make it easier for the patient, for the client, to get in the state that nature can do its job? And that makes your presence in that person's life crucial. 
And you honor the person's beliefs, no matter what they are. Even if they are vastly different from yours, you honor them because they are your client at the moment. And in your presence, in your beingness with that client, whether you agree with them or not, the fact that you honor them gives them an opportunity to heal. And the, here's where uh, the brain goes. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, the person who wrote about novice. Uh, oh, thank you, Patricia Brooks. Uh, she talked about your personal expertise. Your holistic nurse becomes the expert in that moment. She knows what's going on. Drawing upon intuition and creativity, you will never hear a holistic nurse talk about how uh, that intuition is not crucial to their ability to do the work. To be present in that person at any moment, say what needs to be said, do what needs to be done, and the person to grow in as, as they want to. So what we're going to do now is talk about presence. And what we're going to do is an exercise is I would like you to uh, pair up and spread out. Um, so find a, a partner. One of you will be the nurse and one will be the patient. I'm going to ask the patient to not be looking at the screen. Because I'm going to be writing down things I want the nurse to feel. And I just want the nurse to feel these things. Like I might, want, I might write down I want the nurse to be angry. Patient, I want you to talk about what was it like to have an angry nurse present in my space. Or I might write down, <clears throat> I want you to be so busy you don't have time for this person. I've got an hour worth of meds and she wants me to flip her pillow. <laughs> so, or I might write down, I'm distracted because my child was just in a car wreck. Who knows? The thoughts that are very real in your nursing situation. I had a friend who got bitten in the home health nursing. She got bitten by the person's pet goose. So you can imagine that her presence might have been a bit compromised. So we're going to do an exercise on presence. So if you will find your partner and set yourselves up so the nurse is facing this way and the patient is facing that way. You want to be the nurse? Sure. <laughs> I'm the nurse five days a week, so you can be the nurse. Okay. Uh, so to stand up or so you can sit down be comfortable. Yeah, we're going to take the you need to. Oh. Table. Right. Can I take this? Uh, yes. Yes, you may. Oh, okay. Never mind. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> we got it. Oh. Now, when you get seated, what I would like you to uh, do if the nurse is, the person who designates him or herself as the nurse for this first round, if you want to close your eyes so you can concentrate on feeling this thing, feel free. Does everybody have a partner, by the way, or is there somebody left out? Because then you become my partner. Okay. There is somebody left out. You become my partner. She thought she was going to get away with something. Um, but what I will do, if you choose to close your eyes, come on up. Uh, the patient, just don't look at the screen. If the nurse chooses to close your eyes, I will tell you when I'm changing, changing the, uh, the word. So what are we doing? Okay, nurses, are you ready? Okay. So you there talking with your patient, they've got something I want you to pull up my door or don't give up, whatever. You can't you can't stand in front of the speakers. You gotta stand farther back. There you go. Wow. Okay. So nurses, I want you to feel that. I'm just radiated. <laughs> 
<laughs> you can't do a facial oh, you want expression. To say something? No. Uh, <laughs> he blinks first. Huh? He blinks first. Okay. Okay, so nurses, try this one instead. Since people are having trouble being angry. Try this one. Wait, there's a new one up there. No, I'm looking at you. You're my nurse. <laughs> my my life or death depends entirely no, on you. Like you to no. The patients, what you're going to do is tell the nurse afterwards what was the effect on you of what the nurse felt. So here you are being a patient, and you asked for something. Here the nurse comes in. She's angry. She's bad. Worried about her kids, whatever. I want you to tell the nurse what the effect on you was of this nurse feeling that way while she's supposed to be present to you. So now, <laughs> what I'd like you to try yes. is the third one. Sure. Maybe, um, slightly concerned. <laughs> And of course, amused. Abused? Oh, amused. Amused. Oh, amused. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think, in, How do you feel? I think insulted and angry is uh, is this one. Yeah. Yeah. And it itself was distracting. You might be doing your assessment. You're listening to the words. But this is what you're feeling. That's, that's a lot more comforting, i got to tell you. Okay. <laughs> um, concentrating. Listening intensely. Intently, yeah. Now we feel with this emotion. My face? Your face? What did you get in there? Yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. I don't think we are. Oh, I'm having fun. Yeah. It's actually uh, English. Got it in Japan. Doesn't make any sense at all. Oh, really? Hmm. I'm a quarter. My dad's Oh, a quarter? Yeah. My grandma's whole. But the sound advances to you, it's going to be
I tried. I see tears, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can't cry on command. I get a little glycerin eye drops. So. Yeah. yeah, I was trying to. I don't know. But, mm, I guess. I can see it now. Yeah. Well, talking about Japan kind of makes me sad because I was engaged to a girl who lived over there. So. I was engaged to a girl who lived over there. So I guess kind of like. Now she's American. She's over there teaching English. So whenever I think about it, it kind of makes me sad. How many years ago was that? Two. Did you both go over there together? No, I went over there to visit her. My eyebrows come together a little bit. Yeah, I can see. There's an arch eyebrow. <laughs> like with somebody. Really great one. Yeah, so it's hard. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, you, 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 you have the left one. Yeah, good. Can you wave? Go ahead. Keep it cross eyed. <laughs> I can't really die, but I will still Yeah, you, but I can't really do that. The patient's always something that worries me a lot of the time while arching an eyebrow. Like, like, oh, really? <laughs> like, um, I don't know, like when somebody tells, like we just put somebody on the presser or something, and they were going out for a walk, and then they got dizzy, and they tried to get up off of the toilet, and then go, like, crawl back into bed, and I'm like, oh, you did. You should really pull the emergency cord. <laughs> Ask the universe, it'll tell you. Close your eyes and fold your hands. Huh? What's that? She's in the hundred years. Are you really? Yeah, not the not in a conventional sense, no. I do like studying um like shamanism and acrobotany and stuff like that and um, yeah, those, those kinds of issues, that sort of like organized establishments of things that tell people how what, what their relationship with that is supposed to be, and, and like kind of innately distrustful of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. How good is your memory? What? How good is your memory? Um, angry, sad. Are you talking about like what it was? Yeah. Like angry, sad, sweet, joyful, grateful, prayerful. Right, what am I doing now? I feel this one. Huh? What am I doing now? Interesting. Did you get that already? Okay. You did it already. Worried again. <laughs> <laughs> Patience and tell your healer what the effect of the various emotions was on you. Well, in a real setting, my patient or my nurse. I don't know. This isn't a hypothetical. How did you feel? I felt when you were treating me that way. I could have unrealistic because it was more like, what is he feeling? What is he doing? Well, but you were trying to intellectualize it. But how did you feel? Um, yeah, it's complicated, isn't it? It's complicated because it's not real. I'm just trying to put myself in the real thing. It is real, though. I mean, here we are. I'm not a hologram. I'm really here. You know what I mean. I do. If you were really worried about me or if you were really concerned or you were really sad. It's hard to change those on a dime or turn on a dime or whatever. But, yeah. I wouldn't want my nurse to be, like, really sad or worried around me. Yeah. I'd want them to be more. Sometimes kind of exuding a little empathetic concern is like is kind of good, but I, I wouldn't want to overdo it. Yeah. Like I've cried in patient before with the patient with the family, but it wasn't right. Yeah. You go in there crying, you go in there hysterical. Right, right. You know. Yeah.
joyful, I mean, to an extent, you don't want to be ridiculous yeah. about it. I usually leave that to the recreational therapist. Okay, so let me ask you now. That's their department. distracted she wasn't she wasn't talking to me as much and she didn't give me any information and if when I would ask her the other questions she would give me as much information as I would wait for <laughs> so when I was distracted it was like a one word or you know a smile or a nod or a shake of the head but there was no communication back and forth. Mm -hmm. I did. And so when the person was distracted the patient gave one word answer. It's cut off communication. Anybody else? What did you experience? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, as a patient being neglected, you felt it. Mm -hmm. you had to, yeah, the prayerful <coughs> um, emotion had a big impact on you. It immediately changed how I was feeling. Um, and she was also, she also touched my hand, which we were discussing that we don't do a lot of touching that's not half oriented at all. Um, and so it felt really, um, I'm really big on touchy. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that, that, that made a huge difference. It immediately focused my attention back to what was going on and calmed me down. Come on. It was right after worry, too, and so it immediately changed. It's isn't it? So she was saying that when the person who was prayerful, she, as the patient, immediately calms down. Yes. I just thought it was interesting. Like, I was a patient, so I used to say, obviously, so I closed my eyes. And even though, even if I couldn't sense, like, maybe right away from her, like, it was interesting to observe the noise following you in the room as the emotion changed. Like, when someone's worried or angry or distracted, it was really loud in here. Um, and then when they were prayerful or peaceful or happy, it, it, like almost immediately everyone quieted down. And I mean, it, it was just interesting to see like how the whole, it just spread. What she said is that she kept her eyes closed as a patient and paid attention to the volume of the room. With some of the emotions, we call them the more toxic emotions, the volume went up. The more peaceful emotions, the volume went down. Anybody else? Okay, so let's apply this. First, the research. And this is one of the things that has been very interesting to me because we're working with Vanderbilt with a study of healing touch, uh, the effects of healing touch is an alternative accompaniment to modality uh, on the effects of fatigue um, after radiation therapy. What we're finding, and this is the third study where we've gotten the same results is even though the experimental treatment, the healing touch treatment, is significantly better, <coughs> the sham treatment works. What we're realizing is that we've got a person in the room who is a nurse, who cares for the patient, who is causing an effect by her presence. Sorry, gentlemen, it has to be a her because all of the female, all of the uh, in touch practitioners in Nashville are hers. 
So all of the sham people had to be heard. When we get a mail, we'll get to have both. Hmm? No, it's healing cuts. There are different variations of the same thing. Um, but what we're finding is that the presence of another person in the room changes the experimental results. So we've got to redesign some different modalities, uh, this is protocols, and that's what we're looking at for the next study that I'm hoping is going to be on phantom limb pain, but I'm not the one who gets to choose. <laughs> So the presence of the nurse giving the experimental treatment and research is healing. The presence of the nurse giving the sham therapy is healing. Even if you're sitting there interviewing them as the sham therapy, you, if you care for that person, can be offering healing. So we've got to look for a different protocol, a protocol that recognizes <coughs> the presence of a person in the room. Now, this doesn't have to be another person. Say you've got somebody in the room who's angry going to change the results, right? Or who doesn't care one what about the study or about the person. That's going to change the results. I don't know how you filter out this except by finding a way to change the protocol. So that's what we're working on now with the research group I'm part of. And then in teaching, something all of you are intimately familiar with, on one side or another. The instructor's unspoken emotion changes the room. And it's going to change what the students learn. Also, the students' unspoken emotion can change the room. And you can throw your instructor off balance and they get ill at ease and the class goes down in the trash and nobody knows what happened except there was somebody that was so upset that it changed the whole tenor of the room. And what about at home? Because that's where you live your life. When you walk in the room, if you're upset, everybody else in the room can become upset. If you're perfectly happy sitting there doing whatever you do, and somebody walks in the room who's angry or they just been sideswiped or whatever, the dog got out, you're going to get infected by that same emotion. I did some experiments with my husband when I first was starting to play with this. Keep in mind, self-care is my, my thing. So I thought, okay, I'm going to see if I can manipulate this man's emotion un wordlessly. It didn't do well. <laughs> Actually, it worked very well. It worked very, very well because when I would uh, imagine being angry, he just flew off the wall. When I would instantly switch to peaceful, he would calm down. His voice would lower, he would calm down. So I have now learned that all of the problems that I thought were my husband <laughs> are mine. I'm the one that was putting out an emotion that he was responding to. Our marriage has gotten so much better since I figured this out. You cannot begin to imagine that if I'm nice to him, he will clear out the stuff over the roses. <laughs> so go on, I'll do that for you. Okay. So what can you do? First thing, do your self-care. Do your exercises. Check on your nutrition. There are all kinds of good nutrition guides out there. Um, one of the ones you can look at if you haven't looked at it would be right for your blood type but that's bad of them. So the most important would be to pay attention to the emotions in your environment. If you're in the nursing uh, report and somebody's angry, you're sending a bunch of angry nurses out onto the floor. If you drive up to your patient's house at home health and somebody has cut you off and they've blared your horn, horns at them and giving you the finger and all kinds of stuff, Take a moment in the car to center yourself, breathe, let your muscles relax, let your soul repair itself, let yourself come back to a state of being willing to love this person and love yourself. And the most important thing that I've learned is surround yourself with healing people, people who are on a self-healing journey. Now what that, meant, what that meant for me, when I made that deliberate choice, a lot of the people who have been very common in my life disappeared. All of the angry people, I don't see anymore. 
The people who whine and complain, I don't see anymore. They call on the phone to whine and complain, complain and I'll give them about two minutes. I'm not interested in those emotions infecting me. Because as a holistic nurse, as a nurse who at the core of my being wants to do what Florence Nightingale said, and that is to put the patient in a state that nurse, nature can repair that, can, can do its work, can offer healing for that person, I have figured out that I really am the instrument. So the emotion I bring to the, to the moment is going to set the tone for that environment. Maybe the person has decided that they want to commit suicide. Maybe the person has decided that they're not going to do what their physician has suggested or their nurse practitioner. practitioner. But you go in there and you care for them for very little time at all and you have the opportunity for them to change their minds. Now, it's very important to keep in mind that you're not responsible for their decision. You are responsible for the emotions that you put out. That is how what you want to do as, as a, uh, uh, to maximize your presence as the nurse. It really is all an emotional thing. The emotions you bring to the moment are the ones that the, the patient, the client, the family will respond to, and you'll get it back in the state. Now, as uh, student nurses and faculty, one of the things that you could do in your, in your teaching environment, if you wanted to, is start a holistic nurses group and get together and start going through just the first chapter of the holistic nursing book and think about what would it be like to live this. If you've got a faculty member who is a holistic nurse, and you notice there are lots of them, we're the fastest growing nursing organization among all the nursing organizations right now. Um, ask that person if they would be willing to sponsor a holistic nursing group. So what you can do in your, and I do remember both as faculty and student how stressful uh, the nursing educational environment can be for both faculty and students. I always kept thinking the students should quit turning in their papers so I wouldn't have to read them. <laughs> But if you start surrounding yourself with people who are willing to live this kind of life and do so deliberately, I expect you'll find that your educational environment is going to change. So that's something you could do. So that's all I have. I wanted you to experience what a difference you, the presence of you makes to another. So are there questions that I can answer? And that might be a trick. <laughs> Are there questions you would like to pose and we'll see if I can <laughs> Thank you. 
You don't put them in a room alone. You sit and be with them and love them. And that gives them the wherewithal to do the thing they most <laughs> need to do at that moment. So there are no tricks except <coughs> practicing the present to yourself. And that takes self-care. That requires that you put your, yourself first in your own life. And a lot of us have been taught, especially the women, that we're last in our lives, but you're not. You truly are first in your life. So one of the things that you may want to do, if you haven't already, is start taking five minutes a day just to sit in silence with yourself. And enjoy being with you. I mean, you're pretty special. You are the only one of your kind on this planet. So spend five minutes with this unique being and love him, love her. Five minutes a day. Be present to yourself and see what happens in your family, in your life. talking to those in the back who didn't hear about being in psych nursing and how the patients will mimic. Or I expect the nurses also mimic the patients because it's an environment. <coughs> you cannot separate the people from the environment. So you have to be alert to what is going on in the environment and how it is affecting the staff, how is it affecting the patients. And you can change it. You can do this exercise of having the staff in a room, have them feel one thing, have the other side feel comfortable, present, loving, prayerful, and notice what happens. You can begin to train people to be present to themselves, because when they're present to themselves, they're going to be capable of being present to the other person. Yes? I'm very much into um, natural supplements, and um, so of the things we know, should we give our advice, patients? Because nutrition was very important. She would give us advice to patients what kind of supplements, what kind of um, uh, like minerals, vitamins they should take. Is that contradicting with doctors? Okay, I'm not an herbalist. I thought for a while I I thought for a while I'd study all kinds of stuff. And if it's going to take me longer than I want to deal with it, I'm now giving away the book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and herbs is one of them. So I know the herbs that I take. I know the supplements that I take. So what I tell my clients is rather than giving them advice, I give them the address and phone number of the best herbalist in town. And also, I am operating on a nurse's license. I cannot, I don't choose to prescribe anything. I'm not a nurse practitioner. I'm just a plain old ordinary run-of-the-mill nurse. <laughs> and so my choice uh, is to prescribe nothing, but there are a number of herbalists, trained herbalists, certified herbalists who are nurses of the Holistic Nurses Association. They're in a different position than I do. Because of their certification, they might have the credentials to make that kind of advice. I don't. I stay strictly within my nursing license. Yes. Right. Yeah, there are a lot of certific uh, certification programs that are sponsored by the Holistic Nurses Association. I think there's a hypnotherapy program. Uh, um, there's the aromatherapy program. There's the human touch program. There are two aromatherapy programs, two separate approaches to the same thing. I can't remember the others, but there are lots. This is not the political answer, but this is the truth. The difference between therapeutic touch and healing touch is they were started by different people. That's it. Okay. Okay. Yes.
That was an excellent question. Is in my life, as I have made the deliberate choice to bring more love into my life, including by being surrounded by loving people, and all these hostile thoughts disappeared, wouldn't I have been just as, uh, or couldn't I have benefited them by healing them? I didn't deliberately put them out of my life. They disappeared. And now a couple of them are coming back as clients. So, yes, now I can offer them healing that I couldn't have as a friend because I was taking on their anger. I was echoing it back. We were between us. We were making it grow. Is it because they were, you were friends? Yes. Okay. And then as I made this decision, they just kind of moved off. One actually moved to Arizona. That's pretty moved off. But they just... They chose to disappear from my life. I didn't feed them anymore. So I wasn't any fun anymore. And they weren't, they weren't ready. And they weren't ready. Which is also, I don't advertise. I have a flourishing practice. I don't advertise. What am I going to say? I'm going to sit with you and change your life because I love you? And, but it's word of mouth, so it's working. I think you were first to you and then you. Yeah. I have a question, like, uh, what, I guess, what do you do in your practice? Because I can see it brands have a lot of, obviously, holistic, you know, it could be therapy, it could be, you know, herbal. I mean, like, what exactly do you do? The question is, what do I do in my practice? Mine is pretty much entirely a energy healing um, practice with guided visualizations and hypnotherapy. Because what I've realized is all of our wounds are basically spiritual wounds. And so if I can help the person identify the spiritual wound, then the physical pain goes away. It may take a while. I'm working with a woman who's had multiple sclerosis. It's been two, two years this month that I've been working with her once or twice a month. And it's taken this long for her to start taking responsibility for her own disease, rather than blaming the world. Now we can make progress. Because that's the first key, is that you're responsible. Um, so that's mostly my practice. And the energy modalities that I practice are, let's see, healing touch, therapeutic touch, uh, Reiki, craniosacral therapy, the Bowen technique. I use both flower essences and clinical aromatherapy. And whatever else I'll learn next. <laughs> I send people to the finest homeopaths I've met here in Nashville. Splendid. Um, I send them to herbalists. I send them to physicians. I send them where I think they need to go. Let's see. You have to put that. they probably don't stay, but if they're coming because they know that their wound is in their heart, they'll stay, and that's when we can make progress, and you, you have to. Yeah, and it goes back to another comment off of this one again. Um, they can also be family members, and those are the hardest people because that does cause pain when you have to let them go, but I can honestly tell you that um, my mother treats me totally different than she treats my sister because my sister will engage in that circle. And and once she works through that, but it's their choice. So they have to make that decision. You can't do that. 
Her comment was that it's most difficult to let go of miserable people in your life and their family members. But when she chose to do that, this person, her mother, treats her very differently than her sister, who is willing to be to play the misery game, shall we say. Yes. Okay, it is 3.30. Thank you for your attention.